All right, well, why don't we kick off with just a bit of the housekeeping stuff. Um, so the session we're going to have today uh, is going to last about 90 minutes. So lots to talk about. Um, it's a big, broad subject. Uh, I will say right off the top, this is not a technical discussion. This isn't IT focused. Uh, we're talking about the human component of uh, managing digital risk uh, in the humanitarian sector. Um, please introduce yourself in the chat. We won't be doing a round table. Um, the plenary session that we're in now is being recorded. Uh, if you're not comfortable with that, don't share your camera. Um, we had originally been thinking of doing some breakout rooms. We're not gonna be doing that. So breakout rooms are not recorded uh, in HMPW. Um, it is an interactive event. We do want you to engage, ask questions. You can raise your hand. Uh, if there's enough people on here, sometimes it's difficult to see the hand. So you can also type your uh, questions in the chat and we will respond to them. Um, please stay muted uh, unless we're asking you to speak. If you do speak and you're comfortable with doing so, please put on your camera so we know who we're talking to. And if you do run into any technical challenges as we go through the day, just uh, we have our GIS staff, Flora and Megan, who are there to support you. So just uh, message them in the chat and they will help you out. So uh, let's move on. So what we're gonna be talking about today, um, our agenda for the day is, uh, we're gonna start with a bit of a thought exercise. It's just generally intended to get you thinking about some of the challenges. Um, because the digital world is so prevalent around us, uh, it tends to be a bit like the boiling frog. And we tend to lose sight of actually how invasive and pervasive in our lives it is. So we're gonna have a little thought exercise, just get you thinking in the right direction. If you wanna ask any questions about any of the, the uh, things you'll see in the thought exercise, just type them in the chat. And we'll follow them up. Uh, then we're going to talk about the digital threat and the various components of it. It's a broad subject. We had to kind of select down on some key themes, so we'll introduce those as we go along. There are some case studies, some actual real-world examples that have all happened relatively recently that have affected the sector, and we'll kind of try to get our mutual sort of thoughts on how we can address those challenges. And then, as always, we want to come up with some recommendations how to move forward. You know, what's the... Uh, the way to address this in our sector. So how to manage those risks and the ways forward. So that's the day. Again, as we go along, just if you have any questions, let me know. So we're gonna to go to the thought exercise. In front of you is a QR code. There's, I believe about 10 or 11 questions. You're gonna be asked to select one or the other as the most correct answer. Um, the link to the Mentimeter uh, thought exercise is also in the chat. So if you don't have the QR code thing down or comfortable with it, just uh, click on the link and we'll give you a couple of minutes to go through the, the exercise and we'll go back and review. Okay, so let's go back and see what our results were. All right, we seem to think that online activity, uh, more of us think that that's more of a challenge. Next one. Which is more valuable in the modern world? Good, good. I think we're all agreeing in the modern world that diamonds and jewels are nice, but data is critical. Next. <clears throat> Reputation risk, more difficult online than in the field. Obviously, acceptance is harder to manage. Good, next. All uh, right, uh, which poses a bigger risk? Information or an asset? So. I agree, next. This is an interesting one. Um, and we can talk about this as we go through, but uh, we feel that our staff are more vulnerable in the field than they are online. We'll see you have the same opinion when we get to the end. Uh, how's your activity more likely to be monitored online or in person? 50 years ago, even 25 years ago, we might've said in person, but now I think we all realize we're being monitored online, next. How does your organization collect, store, and manipulate data? Well, I'm glad to see the two people are still uh, taking notes and files in cursive on a piece of paper. That's good to see, uh, but not terribly practical in the modern world, and that brings challenges. Next, uh, who wants your data more, hackers or businesses and government? A bit closer result there. We'll see if we all agree again at the end. 
And where exactly is all your data? This is an interesting question. It did come up quite a bit in the session yesterday. But do we really understand where all those electronic bits of data are actually being held and who's in control of them and who has access to them and how secure they are? Next. And this is kind of interesting, uh, and we'll talk about this more. Um, where are your programs more effective in a place where you have reliable digital access or a place where there is none? Um, and I would have to agree there. Okay. So that's our thought exercise. Uh, if you have any questions about any of those or thoughts or suggestions, please share them in the chat. So I'm one of your hosts for today. Uh, I'm James Davis. Um, uh, I am the ACT Alliance Global Security Advisor uh, and been with, working with GISF for quite a while. Um, quite closely. And so uh, I've been brought in to help uh, organize this digital session. I would say up front that I'm not a digital security or IT expert. I come from that generation that remembers a day when phones were connected by a cord to the wall and there was no such thing as the internet. So I'm having to learn this as I go along. But one of the advantages I have in my role is that I do get to step back periodically and look at what are the challenges on the horizon. And I've been looking and training and uh, prepping around digital security for a few years now. Uh, we'll be joined a little later by uh, Professor Lisa Short, who knows a lot more about this than I do, and she will introduce herself as we go along. And Andy Kirkham from Christian Aid, the corporate security manager there, will be uh, getting involved a bit further in the program. So, the digital threat. Um, I think we all you know, deal with the digital world in our daily lives, and we recognize that it can be a strongly positive enabler. Um, we're more connected than ever. The fact that we're all sitting here dialing in from around the world to uh, a session on a, a key subject for our sector, you know, is a testament to the value of uh, the digital world. Um, it allows us to engage better, communicate better, work more effectively. However, the digital environment is so pervasive in our lives, it's like the air we breathe. We don't even see it anymore. It's around us. It surrounds us, it watches us, it listens to us, records what we do, it examines our habits, it sells that information to people that we may not be aware of, um, and it does influence our thoughts. Uh, and we'll be talking about that as we go along. So in the humanitarian sector, uh, we cannot operate without it. Uh, an interesting example recently is Myanmar where um, we have all been engaging around Myanmar, um, and as soon as we started to lose our ability to communicate with our staff in the field, everyone had to start pulling out. Uh, we actually cannot really function as a sector anymore unless we have all of those digital streams that we need to function. So uh, it is affecting our sector. Now, in thinking about how the digital world is affecting our sector, um, it's a broad, broad spectrum. So we've broken it down into three key themes that we're going to address throughout the session. Uh, the first is around transparency. And this is a big issue that I've been having to grasp. Um, having been around the sector for about 30 years, all of our organizations always like to say that we're neutral, we're non-political, we're needs-based, we're transparent. Um, we don't take sides. We just want to help the vulnerable in a conflict situation, uh, in a natural disaster, whether we're advocating for human rights, you know, we're neutral, we're transparent. However, in a digital world, is that really true? And I think we're gonna challenge you today on how transparent we can be and what are some of the consequences for our acceptance with key stakeholders in our industry when we're not transparent. Um, another key theme we're gonna be exploring is perception. So perception is quite interesting. What are the perceptions out there of the sector from external uh, sort of sources? How do stakeholders view us? How do communities view us? How does the cyber world view us? How does social media look at us? How do cyber criminals look at us? How do states look at us? How do agenda influencers look at us? And perception is key and it brings with it, one, a lot of advantages, but two, a lot of risk. And we're gonna be looking at that. And then finally, our vulnerability. I don't think anyone here would ever sort of look at the humanitarian sector, the aid sector in general, and say, we're on the cutting edge of digital technology. Um, we use it, 
it's invasive in everything we do. We're becoming more digitized all the time, especially in a COVID environment. And I think we all accept now that in a post-COVID environment, our digital way of working is gonna to continue to be a key theme. Um, but there are vulnerabilities. Are we really addressing all the risks that come with that shift to a digital way of working? So these are the themes we've chosen to work on. There are others, but I think you can sort of argue that most of them would fall into one of these. So in looking a bit closer at it, um, around transparencies, NGOs hold massive amounts of data. And as we showed in the thought exercise, and it seems that most of you agree, in the modern world, data is king. Data is everything. People will pay billions of dollars for your data. Major uh, social media companies and different platforms that offer uh, digital uh, links to each other as human beings, they do billion dollar deals on a regular basis because they need our data. And NGOs hold a lot of data. We hold data about beneficiaries. We hold data about communities. We hold data about trends, about opinions, about links to various indigenous, ethnic, religious groups, and people want that data. And it also goes to the point of GDPR. So in the EU, we have GDPR, which is uh, a set of rules governing how we manage data. But around the world, there are different sets of rules. Are we compliant in every sector? Are there ways in places that don't hold a GDPR to influence NGOs to give up data? Um, and then, <laughs> and depending on the audience in the room, I haven't gone through the list specifically, uh, in transparency, not all state actors are our friends. Uh, even some donor countries are not the NGOs friends in a certain sense. Let's just say that there are NGOs now major international NGOs we'd all know who stopped taking funding from certain donors who are well known to all of us because those donors are making it a condition of funding to hand over all their beneficiary data. So the identification of everyone who is taking part in any program. And, you know, of course they can explain that away as saying that they are using it as a prevention of fraud and corruption. But the question for us is where else is that data going? Who's it being shared with? Because there's a lot of, uh, let's say foreign departments and intelligence agencies and military organizations would love to get their hands on our data. Um, moving along to perception, uh, it, it doesn't take uh, anyone more than a few seconds to put in a Google search about social media and uh, agenda media. I mean, we all grew up with the idea that maybe media was supposed to be neutral and just report the news. I don't think anyone's been around in the past couple of years agrees that is still true. Um, and you can actually take university courses on how to set agendas. <laughs> can we go back one there, Lisa? Aha. So the agenda setting function theory uh, is reality is one thing, your agenda uh, is another, and how the average person in the street perceives reality can be strongly influenced by social media. So the aid sector is no longer perceived as neutral. It's uh, not transparent and it's not just needs based. We advocate, we hold accountable, we program based on Western ideals, and demand humanitarian space from somebody. Uh, reputations are vulnerable in this space where people can influence the perception of reality. And few, if any NGOs can operate uh, without that climate of acceptance. And so this becomes a key digital battleground for us. Uh, and it does strongly affect our safety and security. And then if we go over to the vulnerability side, um, our sector is worth millions of pounds, uh, millions of dollars, um, and it doesn't take long to do a quick internet search to see what kind of money we're talking about. And though none of us get into the aid business to be, become wealthy, uh, if you're a cyber criminal or you're someone else sitting out there and you're seeing the numbers tossed around because aid organizations love announcing when they get a big chunk of funding for some program they feel passionate about, people say they want their share, they want a cut, they want to. Uh, kidnap someone and hold it for ransom. They want to hack your computer and steal your data and sell it back to you. Uh, they want their cut. There's cash-based programming that can be abused. And there's not a, an agency out there that hasn't faced some of these kind of fraud and corruption challenges because of that vulnerability. Okay, so these are the themes we're going to be looking at. And I'm going to hand over to Lisa now, who's going to take you into uh, a better explanation of some of these. Lisa. 
Thanks, everyone. And I do apologise that every now and then you do get a, an airline announcement. It's not actually the hackers. It's actually that I'm actually sitting in an airport and, uh, and you know, it's part of our digital world. So quite interestingly, I've done my first uh, physical event today in 16 months. That all, all sounds uh, quite foreign. But yeah, I, I, I'm Lisa, uh, Lisa Short, Professor Lisa Short. And um, one of the areas that I do work in is I'm the global chair and the Chief Research Officer for the Global Foundation for Cyber Studies and Research. So this area is quite a passionate area of mine. And our recognition uh, of our digital footprint um, certainly has two sides to it. Certainly the, the human side, but it very much so has um, a positive side. And that's another side that I'd like to, to uh, ensure that we talk about today. But let's just um, uh, talk about the human element side. Um, Let's just set the scene for where we sit. Um, in the last year, the speed with which change has been occurring uh, has just, it, it, we call it a vertiginous rise. It's a vertical learning curve. And if you think your heads are spinning, they probably are. Because organisations are actually um, making decisions 40 times faster than they were before the beginning of the pandemic. Now, that's quite an extraordinary degree of change. In the first half of last year, there was seven years worth of change occurred in the first six months. And the NGO sector and the humanitarian aid sector certainly wasn't devoid of that. Um, you know, you went from being able to be physically in offices, physically around people, to the fact that you're working remotely and completely digitally. And often you are actually separated um, from the actual clients that you serve and the customers that you serve. But I also want you to think about what goes into that space. And that big ubiquitous space, by the way, um, you know, we talk about data in the cloud and data in the virtual space, but behind that virtual space, is that it's, it, data actually isn't in the cloud. It's actually on somebody else's computer. So there's, it, it may go that, you know, that mechanism, it might go from yours to a digital space and then drops down into a physical server, but it's physically being, it's sitting somewhere. How much is it? This is quite amazing. If you can quantify the volume of data in the entire written and, written and spoken word of the human race since its existence, every two days, that same volume of data is being churned out and replicated and put into the system. It's growing by that much every two days the entire volume of the written word and spoken word um, of, of humanity. So if you think about that in terms of the volume of information that's going into the, to the system, and that's why it's also so valuable uh, in terms of monitoring our behaviours and our, what we buy and we sell and where we are and what we, where we're located and all of those sorts of things. Every single thing that we put out there goes into that data space. Even believe it or not, when you type a text and you delete it, those deleted pixels and you deleting that word goes into the data space and that's of course how we get predictive texting and, and those sorts of pieces of information. But something else is really important and very important in this NGO space. 56%, so that's well over half of the entire world population of about 8 billion people are connected to social media. And a very large percentage of them are connected to one of our most famous, of course, which is Facebook. And every second, so every single second that we're in that space, there's another 15 and a half, I'm not sure how they get the half a person, but there's 15 and a half people who join every single second of every single day. That's how fast it's growing and socially connected through social media. Now, it's therefore not, unsurprising that the humanitarian aid organizations and the NGOs have become more active and aligned upon new, new technologies. And it's not just the social medias, it's our messaging apps, it's our digital um, a way to engage, it's our recording systems, it's having Zoom meetings, it's training, it's absolutely everything that we touch, our touch point is virtually, virtual and digital now. And you aren't exempt, it's how you make payments. Um, it's engaging in the, the um, crypto space and the, um, to actually to be able to take payments in many cases. So UNICEF and, and the World Health Organization has moved into that space as well, um, purely um, because of the safety mechanisms in that. So what's also important is that these changes, whilst they've been faster 
during the pandemic. Those changes were already there beforehand. And so some of these risks and hazards that we are facing now were already in existence. They've just gotten wider and faster and more prominent in the last year. And of course, there are some specific reasons as to why um, that that uh, is, is, a, is an extra risk. And it's because of course, we, we tend to be sitting in an area of vulnerability where we, we appear to be under the under pump, under the pressure. Um, and of course, packers actually um, take note of that and think that we're more vulnerable. Um, so your organisations have actually evolved from being um, what we might call bystanders in many ways to fully fledged stakeholders in the cyberspace. Whereas before you might have physically been um, just engaging with clients, uh, you know, rather than actually being, you know, on your computers, on your iPhones, doing the things that you need to do, you were physically out there doing the work that you needed to do. Now you're not. Now you're fully fledged into that cyberspace, which means that your di digital footprint and your digital exposure is no different to the rest of the world. And one way you, you, can, you can think about this, and that's why we wanted to bring this down to the human element, is that when you're at home in your own physical environment, you could be standing naked inside and you can close the blinds and the doors and the windows and no one from the outside can see in. You know who's in your house, you know who you're exposing yourself to, who can see you, who can, who can make you feel vulnerable. When you're in the digital space, it's like standing on the street corner naked everybody can see you. Everything that you do is permanent and out there in the virtual space. And that's the way you have to think about it. That literally you are fully exposed unless you choose to cover yourself up. Um, and that's almost the vulnerability that we talk about when we talk about having a digital footprint. Um, so it's really, a, it, it can be what we call a Janus space situation where organisations, there's a positive and a negative side to this. So. Um, organisations are certainly able to build on the advantages of the new technologies and we can't underestimate that. And if I, I want you to think about things because we're all very critical and very quick to be critical of e.g. the social media platform. You know, Facebook always comes up first. You know, it's always, a, it's always sort of bag, bag Facebook or, or, or bag Twitter or, or, or LinkedIn or any of those. But I want you to think about one thing. Can you imagine the last year without them? I want you to really think about all of you, all of you that have been segregated and separated from family and friends. I'm one of them. My family's on the other side of the world. Um, I want you to think about how your life would have been without those social media platforms. So the, the benefits and the positivity that we have out of our engagement digitally and being able to still function and work and do everything that we do, our efficiencies, um, the fact that even in the NGO space, the, the dollars that are donated go further than they did before because we can be more efficient in that space. But of course, the Janus space for that is that we're also exposing ourselves to be more vulnerable to malicious and adverse cyber threats and attacks. And um, it means that in that digital space, somebody is actually going to be after us because we are more digitally exposed. One of our greatest exposures though, is not technology, it's us as human beings. And, and you know, I often talk about the fact that the greatest digital risk we have is that. It's what we do with that finger and what we actually open, close, touch or choose to do. Um, and the same is in the cloud, data goes to the cloud and it physically sits on a computer. It's not just sitting up there like a, you know, like a storm cloud. It's not just sitting up there in the sky. It's physically on somebody's computer. There is not a piece of technology that doesn't have a human sitting behind it. Computers don't just do things on their own. There is a person that sits in behind every one of them. So it's really important to think about that. But because agencies work in highly geopolitical and tense areas of the world, um, you do have some quite unique um, challenges that are faced. Um, and uh, one of those areas, of course, pertains to the, to the area of trust. And I specifically put this, this slide in because the humanitarian and aid organisations, over their years of development, um, your work has been dependent, hang on, <clears throat> your work 
is dependent on the fact that people trust you. You will gather data and information that no other organisation will obtain. In fact, you can gather data, um, even recognition of names, dates of birth, you know, private information, personally identifiable data. And there needs to be a segregation between what we call personally identifiable, in other words, that it connects back to me as an individual, and the data that we know, which is pixels of information that might allow us to do shopping and so forth. In this case, NGOs, and humanitarian aid organisations may in fact be having the highest degree of politically sensitive information about refugees, about political asylum seekers, about the location of vulnerable individuals, and they trust you. So we have a greater responsibility for that information that we accept um, in a trusted environment, because if we break that level of trust, that means we actually break down some of the very ethos and the, the foundational reasons that NGOs and humanitarian aid organisations exist. So it's critically important to think about that. Um, I think I've actually missed, uh, let me go back. This is very sensitive today. So the current state of affairs, this might blow you away. So, Attackers are hoping to benefit from money that was intended for their pandemic. So there is a greater volume of money that's going through the system at the moment. In fact, trillions of dollars of aid is going through the system. And so the, the hackers and the malicious cyber actors, the nation state actors, they are fully cognizant and aware of that. They're also very cognizant that um, they're trying to capitalise on the disruption and the weakness that weaknesses that they see and the vulnerabilities they're also trying to, to capitalize on the fact that people have gone from being physically involved in in work to digital systems and they've probably done it without all the security mechanisms in place what's important to know is that there is not one single ngo anywhere in the world that has not already had a significant breach in their cyber system so if you think you haven't been breached, you have. And that's quite profound. So you're better off to assume that you have been rather than I wonder if I have been. You have been. The same as, by the way, and you're not actually alone in this. Every educational institution in the world has been also um, hacked. So World Health Organization is experiencing double the volume of hackers that they had in, in, in 2019. So it's 50% increase. Um, to what they've had before. Um, our current systems, though, have a tendency to restrict sharing of some data, but not sufficiently protect information that could identify individuals and communities. In other words, in one of the case studies that we'll talk about uh, is the Uyghur people. Um, and so there is, is systems and processes to ensure that e.g. GDPR, we don't, we don't share personally identifiable data, but there's ways that they can get around it. So there's, there's, not way, there's ways that we can lure people um, to sharing that information without them knowing. The other thing that's important is the fact that you go back to that, you know, every two days, the volume of data that's being churned out and entered into the system, the volume of information outstrips our capacity to analyse the risk. So organisations, your big aid organisations, do actually do threat risk assessments and they actually have systems and processes in place to see when it's unusual activity um, that's being monitored um, in our system. But the volume of information is so high and so great that our, our capacity to cope with that is being outstripped. Um, we're not keeping pace with it. Um, and I think the other thing that's here is that the increasing penetration of mobile and digital technologies into our vulnerable areas. So if, if we, we're literally going into digitally non-literate areas, you know, in your emerging economies where we're taking digital technology into areas where some of these people actually have never used the internet or used devices, certainly never seen smartphones and those sorts of things. We're handing them and engaging with them in a digital world without the level of digital literacy that we have. And so that places us at huge risk. We're also going into environments where the socioeconomic levels are lower than what we might have in the westernised world. And that means where we might buy uh, you know, uh, legitimate copies of the software and security 
some of these people are actually using pirated copies by pirated copy by pirated copy. And of course, they lose each time the capacity to, um, you know, have those secure mechanisms by doing that. When we engage with them, we also expose our risk there. Um, and there's another concept in this as well. And these are some of the things that, that, are, that are important to think about is that we have a also have a mentality of a free mount mentality and I, I did say this in the session that we had yesterday i want you to think about this if an application is free and we've already said that data is more valuable than diamonds and jewels in fact it is the most valuable um substance that we have on on the on the planet um that we live on is data if that's so valuable and an application is free you are the product so I need you always to remember that it's it's a it's a it's a mentality that we need to think about that a paid application is paid because it revenue generates by being a paid application. If it is free, and I don't care which one it is, data is the product. You are the generator of the data. You are the product, and therefore there will be data being generated in the background. And so that means again goes to this this digit here. The volume of applications that we are starting to use because of the rapidity of change that we've had to go through to get to the digital status that we are now means that we don't even have a chance to read, well, most of us don't read the fine print of applications. Most of us don't go into the settings of our phones and, and, and make sure that we follow up on those um, uh, settings within our phones and devices to ensure that we are operating in the most secure way. So there is a huge opportunity um, for a massive amount of social engineering. In fact, I read another article today where there were 21 million Facebook profiles um, registered, obviously registered by a bot, a bot gets into the system, registers 21 million false profiles, and those false profiles generate information that manipulate your minds and thinking and the news, the feed that you read, so you think somebody is behaving in a certain way when in actual fact and in actual fact they're not. And of course they can influence political uh, voting systems. They can influence the way that we think about um, environments and a whole range of other things. So social engineering is huge when there we are engaged in this, in this digital space. The other one is misinformation, disinformation. In fact, during the pandemic, the only thing that spread faster than the virus was in fact misinformation and disinformation. And it is so difficult to tell what's true and what's not um, in, the, in, the, in the world that we play in. So broadly in this area, again, we've had to sort of bring this down to some themes again as well, is to think about the digital space and its impact, three key areas, people, 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 followed by processes and technology. So in other words, the human element is still the most critical. 90% of most malicious cyber attacks and um, attacks that we get digitally are caused by people error, not by processes and not by technology. Um, they're caused by people who deliberately make errors, inadvertently make errors, are uneducated, are unaware, et cetera. All the change is so fast, we just haven't been able to keep up with it. But technology, you can see it's like the third, it's the third wave of conversation. We, we can't rely on the fact that we're going to have a digital wall there, um, you know, to protect us. It is actually up to us to actually be educated and understand. So that's why people and humans are the most important element there. Um, which is why I like to finish this little section, and I do want to get on to the case studies, <coughs> is that a classic example here is, you know, uh, here we are, two, two autonomous vehicles out there driving. You know, we think our self-driving cars were texting each other. No, they weren't. There was two humans sitting in those vehicles that were texting each other that weren't observing. The cars don't just control themselves. There is actually still a human element sitting there. So, again, it's, we really want to concentrate this back to the human element. Behind every piece of technology, there is a human. A, a computer and a, and a program doesn't develop itself. It's developed by a human. Hacking and malicious wear starts with a human. Yes, it may be automated, but it starts with a human. Um, and that's really, really critically important in this discussion. So the things that we do and the things that we influence in our digital footprint 
comes back to how much we um, actively go out to keep ourselves educated um, and ensure that we understand the exposure that we're, we're placing people into. So we're going to move into the case studies because yesterday we ran a bit short on time. So we've actually shortened the, the first bit and we're going to go into the case studies so we've got more time on this. And the first one, I think the first one, we're, we're going to stick to the three uh, areas here. So these are the three case studies that we've brought, brought up. We've got an individual case study for each one of those. One under transparency, one under perception and one under vulnerability. We do want you to engage those. So either raise your hand and we can bring you in or if we can actually see the questions and we can answer the questions in the session. But we'll just give you a few moments to read these and then we'll go into the individual case studies and each one of us is going to run you through those. We're not going to go into a breakout. We're just going to go straight into the session and run through these. So if you want to have just a really quick read of these. Actually, just it might even be easier. I was going to say it might even be easier if we actually go into it. We don't yeah, really need to start we can go, it. Just before, we do, we, just before we jump straight into them. Um, I, I was actually waiting to see when you were talking about um, misinformation and social engineering, uh, a lot of the NGOs in my organization itself, one of the organizations I work with, uh, is having a child's own vaccinations. And we have a whole group of staff in one country who are refusing to be vaccinated now because they have come to believe that vaccines are not safe and that herbal remedies produced locally are probably safer for them. And that produces a whole massive mm -hmm. duty of care challenge and operational mm -hmm. challenge and risk management challenge for the organizations. Um, mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of stuff around vaccination. So it's a, a really good example. I was wondering if anyone was gonna bring it up in the, uh, the chat. Also, I would say uh, it's kind of interesting. I was going through the people who are attending and we have a couple of people who are working around AI. So when you were talking in that last little cartoon about always a person behind the computer program. I wondered if our AI people were gonna to toss anything in. Actually, you raised two really good points actually. So the vaccination um, misinformation, disinformation is actually quite profound uh, that's out there. And that's actually been quite deliberate. So you need to, to think about, and I, um, there's whole sessions and whole programs that we run on social engineering, for example. So it's to advantage uh, and you may think why would people do that? Because it's to people's advantage to keep certain groups of people vulnerable. Um, and they can actually literally put out that false information and misinformation and tell people, and, and especially when, it, when a group of people are already feeling vulnerable, they've already been through a year of fear, uncertainty and dread. We throw in then, oh, we've got a vaccine, um, and even, the, even the, the elements where people thought, for example, that Microsoft had put in, put in um, uh, trackers into the vaccine and so forth, absolutely no basis for that whatsoever. But boy, oh boy, that information spread and that literally can start to influence people's minds and thinking, even down to the fact of, if you think about um, the social engineering around and the misinformation around the dangers of blood clotting and, and vaccines. Um, and, and if you actually really want to put the facts out there in terms of risk, and there's a few elements have been, the risk of blood clotting um, from a vaccine is so minuscule compared to, for example, women taking a contraceptive pill. But that didn't serve the benefit of the social media channels and the media channels to put the facts out there. there there's always a, a, a conversation that says if, 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 it, if it doesn't bleed, it, it doesn't, you don't bleed. Uh, and so it is, it is important to think about when we actually have these discussions about, um, about social engineering, is it true and is it not? And, and my, my, most of the time it's actually not. So very important. And in terms of AI, AI is only as good as the data that is inputted into it. And there is still a human behind that is designing those algorithms. So this is an interesting one because we can actually design into AI and machine learning the same bias that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So AI and machine learning only learn from the algorithms that we've designed to put in there. So there is still a human sitting in behind that as well. Okay, a couple of interesting questions in the chat. We have Siobhan hmm. um, to everybody. Uh, she said she wrote a paper on uh, data protection in the humanitarian sector. It still hasn't seen any growing understanding in the day-to-day -day work of NGOs. Um, around the risks related to technology. So she's asking, are there any projects, organizations, networks actively working on this? 
um, in the panel's experience, where are these conversations taking place? Lisa, do you have any thoughts actually, on that? Yeah, actually, quite interestingly, um, the actual live event that I did today, I actually had the director of UNICEF, who is actually literally designing the GDPR, global GDPR and data privacy policy for UNICEF. It was quite a fascinating conversation. So yeah, the answer to that is yes, there is. Um, and the answer to that is that it's a complex problem. What I was uh, quite interested in uh, was that humanitarian aid organisations work cross-jurisdictionally. So uh, GDPR, of course, protects any data that, that is developed uh, or originated in the, in the EU and the UK environment, and it's quite a strict um, data provisions and pr privacy provisioning um, legislation. But the challenge we also have, though, is that most of our other data is cross-jurisdictional. So if you have data that's generated in states in the US and uh, there's been a, 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 a breakdown in the relationship between the EU and the US, so in other words, you can't share data between the US and the GDPR and be GDPR compliant anymore. So there are challenges in this space. So the answer is yes, it's a complex problem. Um, the other challenge is that in the... Uh, Humanitarian aid organisations and uh, the NGO sector, you're required, as you quite rightly said, James, to share information that other organisations aren't. So in other words, your scrutiny and your auditing, because it's donated money and it's, and it's um, beneficiary money, is often scrutinised more than any other organisation, which, which requires dis disclosures um, of data. The lack of education of staff about what data actually is, what is personally identifiable data, um, when we're capturing it, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a big, it is a big problem, um, but it was interesting. Yes, so, so the answer to that is yes, there are some projects um, happening. Obviously, UNICEF is working on trying to establish what does it look like to have a global privacy uh, policy and what, what does it look like to push that out? Um, and then technically, how do we actually manage that? Because as you know now, the amount of data that we've got being collected on our private devices uh, and so forth is a huge challenge. So we could have a whole session on that, but the answer to that is yes. Um, I'm certainly happy, happy if somebody wants to connect with me and I can put them in touch with, with what's going on in that space. Okay, and one more quick uh, question in the chat before we move into the case studies. Um, so Dave Simpson from Red R is suggesting that, uh, uh, not to detract from Lisa's point, but emerging economies have uh, proven their ability to adapt to technology more quickly and completely than the West. And he's using the example of mobile banking technology. Uh, incredible take up in a very short space of time um, because they don't have to invest in that infrastructure, you know, the normal banking systems. Um, and so emerging economies aren't necessarily behind the curve. Now, I'll, I'll let you answer that effectively in a minute, but I'd just like to, to say to Dave, it's also one of the points here is digital education and awareness. So one of the places where social media can influence opinions around misinformation and changing perceptions of reality is in people who don't have that ability to judge what is real and what is not. So in a very technical sense, yes, emerging economies are very quick to adapt to a digital environment because there's a lot lower infrastructure upfront cost, but are the individual users being well represented by the companies who are bringing in these digital technologies who all you know, come with their own agendas? And I pass over to Lisa to respond. Yeah, it's actually a good point. You'll see one of the logos on my screen there is Africa Agritech. So I do a lot of work. I probably, probably seem, I seem to be in Africa probably 40% of my day. Um, you are correct in the sense that we have a, we have a terminology called leapfrogging. So um, in the emerging nations, one of the reasons they have such a, a high uptake of mobile technologies, and in fact, they also have a very high uptake of digital currencies, blockchain um, solutions. And th this comes back to this quick question we had about trust before. So in the westernised world, we've got infrastructures and we've got governments and we've got systems and processes. Now, we might not lot And Lisa's signal is frozen. Just while we're waiting to get her back, I see Matt Evan has uh, put in a couple of points about uh, AI in the uh, chat. Um, that would be a good conversation to take up, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole here because we do need to get moving along into the case studies as soon as Lisa comes back. <coughs> All right.
Tell you what, uh, why don't we just move along into the first case study, which I was going to uh, lead on anyway, and if we get Lisa back, she can finish her answer. So uh, in this case study, we're going to look at the issue of transparency. Uh, Laura, could you get the uh, slide back up, please? There we go. So uh, this time we're looking at transparency. Um, the case study location uh, is a Central Asian country. It doesn't really matter which one. Um, it's a large international NGO with a European headquarters operations in over 15 countries globally. The incident occurred around 2017. So in this particular situation, the NGO was operating in this country. It was facing a lot of challenges in its programming there. It was getting finding difficulty in sourcing funding for its programming, and it made the very difficult decision, as in happens in any NGO, to close down uh, operations in that country. And so, um, as it made that decision, it recognized it had a, a challenge. Other international organizations who closed there had international staff members and managers arrested uh, by the government, and ex basically resolutions and settlements were then um, negotiated before the international staff would be released. And so the organization made the safety and security decision to not be transparent about its closure. So it went to some rather extreme lengths. And if you go down into uh, the measures it took, uh, first off, in any meeting that the senior management team had about closing down operations in this country, no mobile phones, no laptops, were allowed into um, the program, or were allowed into the meeting room. Um, they were extremely concerned that this foreign government was gonna be listening to their conversations. And for anyone who's not sure whether you can be listened to your, through your phone, we can talk about that separately. Um, in addition to that, there was not a single email, voice call, or any other digital medium where the closure was discussed. The NGO decided that anything that was done would be done in person, uh, talking one person to another in a safe context uh, or handwritten down, but those handwritten copies would never travel inside the country. So what they tended to do was they were inviting international staff out to regional conferences, which was basically a cover to have conversations on the side about the closure process. Um, and national staff who were working for the organization were not told as far as they were aware, they were continuing as per normal. So when they finally finished up, uh, they, about a week prior to the actual closure date that had been decided, all the international staff ended up leaving the country for various conferences or other uh, work trips. They took all of their personal effects with them or as much as they could carry or could ship out prior. Uh, and once they were all out of the country, the NGO announced the closure to national staff. Um, and it was only a couple of days away. Now, the, the organization did its best for national staff. There were settlements. They weren't uh, just abandoned there in the country. There was arrangements made with uh, partner organizations to continue the programming work that they'd been doing. Assets that the NGO had in the country were then um, donated to its partner organizations. Um, but this would be an example of not being transparent. So the question I have for all of you, and I hope to see some responses in the chat, are did the steps this NGO went to, were they too much? Were they adequate? Uh, and what are the risks if this becomes common in the NGO sector to uh, be so untransparent that major stakeholders, countries, staff, donors, um, we're not being transparent with them. What are those risks? So any questions in the chat, put your hand up and let's see what you think. Lisa, are you back now? We can get you to follow up. We can get you to follow up with the, 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 finish that uh, in a bit. Yeah. The wonders of technology. All right, I'm just gonna scan down and see if we have any hands raised around this one. No thoughts on transparency? No thoughts about did this organization go too far? Uh, we do have a question in the chat from Eric uh, at World Vision. I like the emphasis on the human side of digital tech. 
uh, digital liter literacy and raising awareness on the opportunities and risk of digital, especially among the vulnerable populations that we serve is so critical. Uh, any comments on this Can particular? I'm... Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I'm just, I was gonna say, um, yes, I think on, on the, the uh, if I can just raise a point on the, the transparency. Um, it's a fundamental, it's a fundamental foundational thought that we have that we have trouble shifting our mindset to, I think, in, in terms of uh, the transparency one, that we feel that to disclose every, we have to disclose everything to be transparent. So I think there's a, we have to, we have to draw a line in the sand about um, transparency in the way that we function and we operate doesn't mean transparency about everything we disclose. And if I, if I can think about it like this, in terms of our own, your own life, if you think about it like this, you can live a very transparent existence and be honest and trustworthy and so forth, but that doesn't mean to say that you show the world what's in your bank account. You don't show, you don't take out your most personal possessions and show it to everyone. It still it doesn't mean to say that you're not living a transparent life and you're not um, you know, doing the right thing. So at the concept of transparency um, in everything you do, I know I, I understand fully is that um, we are now, you're now having to, to, to go into this digital um, secure and, and safe space for protection. And you can't always be completely exposed in that vulnerable space. But it's, if you can think about it like that, um, I'm not saying that you hide things. What I'm saying is that you know, for protection means now it's it's a different it's a different ball game. And the same is that you wouldn't invite. Okay, if you think about, um, you know, if you went with hitchhiking, you might have hitchhiked in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, even 70s, maybe. Would you possibly do that now? Possibly not. So the world has changed. So again, it, it's just. It's just to think about how you would expose yourself in that in that regard and what you would would show to the rest of the world. Just Andy, remember whatever goes out there. I was going to ask Andy if he had any thoughts on the transparency issue. Nothing that uh, that Lisa hasn't already covered. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I see Matt right. uh, Matt Heaven in the. Uh, the chat was saying that uh, it was a bit too much and that uh, NGOs do need to be accessible. Okay, well, why don't we move on to the next case study then? And I hand over to Andy. Thanks, James. So this, uh, this case study, study is, um, is based on um, a ransomware uh, ran uh, ransom attack, which, which occurred. And it's a very, uh, very common situation around a um, headquarters which is hosting um, several NGOs within their building. Um, I know of quite a few NGOs who, who are doing this. Um, so a large NGO will host smaller smaller NGOs. So the, the scenario, the situation is that um, a senior director um, working uh, for a large organization who are hosting multiple um, smaller NGOs share the IT infrastructure within their, their building. Each organization has their own um, data brick. So they're uh, within their main server. So they're, they're able to keep it uh, to a level of separacy, uh, separate. Um, but uh, on this particular occasion, one of the senior directors um, inadvertently downloaded uh, some form of malware or Trojan uh, onto, uh, onto the laptop. Uh, and subsequently, um, thereafter, um, she received a um, ransom demand over her phone. Um, she was locked out of her um, laptop. She was locked out of the servers. Um, all her data was uh, was 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 frozen. Um, so the organisation went into um, a, a level of crisis. There were obviously all the all the relevant uh, cybersecurity measures in place: the firewalls, the anti-spam. They they also had um, uh, internal training to make staff aware of spam emails uh, uh, and phishing emails. The the, the standard uh, IT uh, online learning um, uh, training that goes on. 
Um, the IT system would normally block any uh, malicious emails on a regular basis, but it was not immediately apparent how the virus was delivered onto uh, the director's uh, laptop. Other server users were not informed of the breach or advised to take extra precautions whilst, um, whilst the, the, the organization was managing this. Um, the resolution thereafter, it took a few days, but uh, the resolution was that the ransom was paid of about $160,000 uh, through a negotiation and uh, by international uh, transfer. Um, the hackers did release the computer back to the director's control. Uh, and it was suspected the organization was ta targeted on the basis of international profile. So the, the, the case study is a real one. It's happened uh, and it's, uh, uh, from what I gather, it's happened to quite a few uh, organizations over the past uh, a couple of years. Um, what is the perception? Now, from a, from a security professional, from my, my the, the, the transferable skills here from a, from a physical security, personal security element, when we're dealing with K and R kidnap and ransoms, when we're dealing with walking out uh, in the in the communities that we work in, and when we're working walking in uh, dark roads and uh, walk in areas where we're by ourselves, we look after our um, personal security and situation awareness. And there is, you know, there, there is a perceived wealth of uh, of NGOs when you when working in in the field. I'm just interested to hear uh, in the chat, or if anyone wants to unmute on what what would what does this what 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 could this occur what, what what's the likely scenario now to continue uh, happening um uh, now that a ransom's been paid um and you know what are the perceptions that are, that are going to be uh, uh, be out there with the with the, the criminal networks um who are doing these ransom ransomware okay i might pop in there but I was yeah, say, there's, a, there's a good there's, there's a good question actually in the um, in the chat there that's saying uh, would you recommend the NGO document decisions along the way for future audits and yes and how you know how would they document? I think in terms of this and uh, in terms of, of ransom ransomware, which is one of the most common um, things, and there's a there's a fair bit of misinformation around this as well. So very large majority of ransomware attacks um, and the way they way they get into systems is is through email, um, people opening email um, that is dodgy. So if it looks dodgy, sounds dodgy, probably is dodgy. Um, and, and that means um, if, if, you, if you want to be anything like my parents, I've got 85 and 86 year old parents, doesn't matter how many times I tell them, um, a, a strange email comes in and it's asking for information that's asking you to go to another site and verify something. And I say to my parents, don't open it. And they go, oh, I just opened to see what it was. No delete it and if it is a legitimate thing that you're supposed to have done somebody will ring you and let you know and nine times out of ten they don't so if it is dodgy looks dodgy smells dodgy probably is dodgy so that's how the, the majority of them get in but i think the other thing that's really important is that there is always a fine line between uh with ransomware in saying well you know if i pay it and I get the data back, it's, it's going to cost me less than it would be if I, if I lose my data. So if I breach data or, or the data is made public and the fines I might get and, you know, like, and whatever it's going to cost me. The challenge we have is ransomware is only taken off because people pay the ransom. And so there is a big conversation going on around the world is at what point, the same as, you know, do you pay ransom if, if the person is physically, um, uh, you know, captured and, and, uh, and kidnapped, for example. So the catch is that it, it perpetuated a cycle because one of the easiest ways to get money, people live in a, in a state of fear that they are going to actually do what they say they're going to do. The other thing that there's a lot of misinformation about, and uh, it is a sector that I pay in, is that the um, the advent of these ransomwares is, is being used, or that it's a crypto fraud, that in other words, cryptocurrency is being used for uh, money laundering and these ransomware. It's actually nothing that's not, not the case. In fact, we know that 0.03% of all crypto transactions are fraudulent and they're not associated here. It may be the means that they use for payment, but it's actually traceable. So, um, you know, if people have a duffel bag of money, that's actually not traceable, whereas a cryptocurrency is actually traceable. Um, so that's actually not the reason. That's, again, misinformation um, that's out there. So uh, in terms of 
uh, you know, negotiating and who pays and so forth, uh, you know, let's back it up a few steps and have processes in place to know what to do when these occur. Um, and of course, the, the conversation is that if they, if they got $160,000 out of you easily this time, the next time it's going to be more. If they think, well, that was easy, got 160000 out of that lot, I'll go over it next time, I'll go in for a million. What do you do then? How high do you go and how far do you go and how far do you agree? So the insurance council is actually going to drive a lot of this because a lot of, uh, a lot of these ransomware initially were covered under insurance and they won't be moving forward. Do hackers sometimes give the data back? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just say, we'll have the money, we just won't use the data. Um, sometimes they don't actually have access to it. So again, um, you know, it's a complex question. It's not an easy one um, to answer. It's also uh, an emotional one when we know sometimes they're threatening um, or the data that they've got or the exposure that they've got or the access to your system um, can actually expose people. Um, so there is a, it is a complex problem. It's always good, better to have prevention than cure. Um, and the answer to that in terms of recording is always yes, because um, any systems, any, any breakdown in a system we should record. It's always going to be digital anyway. Um, but yeah, record. And, and again, that's a strategic planning for a process that all organisations should have in, have in process um, as far as the recording mechanism. Okay, uh, just a couple more uh, points in the chat. Just very quickly on this one though, around the, uh, the ransomware. Um, one of the things I work in a structure where we have a global alliance of about 130 members. Uh, there is about 30 international organizations in the alliance and the balance of 100 are national organizations. And increasingly with the grand bargain and the, the shift to localization, this is happening. The thing you have to remember is that um, to operate in a digital context is expensive. A lot of smaller national organizations and local partners cannot afford site licenses for all of your typical uh, Microsoft Office, for Zoom accounts, and for all the things we need. Very often you have with smaller organizations that don't have this kind of funding because donors don't tend to fund it, is they download pirated copies of the software so that they can access it. And so when you're working with these partners and they send you an email with an attachment that they have generated through pirated software, which means they don't get security updates that we download several times a week and be, can be quite annoying when we're trying to get something done. All of a sudden we're told we have to update for 10 minutes and then restart our computers. They don't have that. So there's a vulnerability there. And when we're doing our due diligence with a local partner around a program, are we looking at their digital capacity? And are we looking at what risks we're taking on board by partnering with them if we're not going to fund them with all their site license and everything else they need to operate in a digital context? So there's a, a sort of a point right there. And this uh, person in this case study, this could have been one of the ways that an email come in from someone she knew and trusted who was operating with unlicensed software. So there's a lot of complex issues around this, but I want to go uh, over to the chat and Dave was saying reference the first case study around the problem uh, of shifting the responsibility around data and security between uh, the government arresting NGO workers and the NGO not being careful enough with data. And Dave is saying that uh, once you perceive to be hiding information from the government, uh, could you be making things worse? So our state actor is gonna be less trusting of NGOs because they're starting to hide data. And what's the consequence of that? And this goes to the whole concept that I said initially that, um, NGOs are not sitting down and creating a policy around how are we going to manage our transparency. We have things like GDPR, which is forcing us to handle data specifically, but in terms of our wider operations, our risk management strategies, and this is a security risk management session, are our senior management team sitting around and really looking at the issue of transparency and drawing where our red lines are and making sure our staff are aware of our policy around how we're going to manage transparency, and I would challenge that that's not happening. We have one more question from uh, uh, Eric around the uh, perception case study. So the organization paying the ransom clearly indicated the value of the data on their devices to the hackers. There's also no guarantee that the data was not copied and sold on elsewhere. So what assurance does the organization have that the hackers handed over uh, the information that was on the server? Andy, Lisa? Yeah, look, I'll hop in on that one. You're absolutely correct, Eric. In many ways, um, there is no guarantee. That's the challenge with, with ransomware. 
So um, if you think they're only, they only try to sell it once, they try to multiple sell it. Um, so it's a bit like, you know, if I've got one copy of the book, I can then just keep selling it. I'll, I'll, I'll target different people because if they've got, if they actually have the data, they also know that um, who's got it, who's, you know, included in that data. You are correct. You also, uh, they have just identified how valuable it is. Um, and generally, I can tell you it's generally around privacy, it's generally around customer and consumer data and so forth. So, um, and there'll be, if there's a breach of it, that it's, that it's damaging to the business. Sometimes it's commercial information uh, as well, but in terms of NGOs, it's, it's likely to be more around personalised data, geopolitical data, locationing data, uh, and certainly trying to access um, access funds that their main interest is to get cash so most if it's nation state that state actors the cash is not an issue what they're after is the data uh, if they're after cash like these ransomware they're generally just after the cash they're really not after the content that's in the data I and mean, that's in generalization i know that because that's not always the case but um you know you just need to, to think about it in in that regard is there a is there a chance they won't give the, the service back? Absolutely there is. Um, that's the challenge with ransomware. They could actually say, well, you've paid 160,000, I'm still not gonna give them back, I'm gonna go to more. So they'll actually start to blackmail you into more. So um, that is one of the big problems that we have with ransomware. It's such easy, it's an easy take. The challenge is, it's, it's, it's always the challenge, do we, don't we, do we, don't we, which, which way do we go? Um, do we call their bluff and say, well, go, go for it? Um, and, and of course, the other one, which is the second part of the question, is in these breaches, do we expose and do we tell the stakeholders whose data has been breached? Um, that's challenging in your sector because, and this comes back to the transparency, because, okay, if it's beneficiaries and if it's people that are capable of having an understanding of what's just occurred, then yes, you can disclose that information, but how can you disclose that to individuals who are already digitally um, illiterate and challenged? So it could be uh, consumers in emerging nations, you know, it could be uh, people for the first time that have been digitally connected, and even though they may have skills, and I'll, talk, I'll finish that answer in a minute, but they may have some skills, they won't have all skills. And so telling them that they've had a data breach probably possibly won't mean a great deal to them because they actually won't know the repercussions of what that looks like and what that means. So um, the answer is yes, they are required to. There is, a, there is an obligation to do that, but whether there's an understanding is not. So again, these are very unique challenges that we do face in the humanitarian aid and, and the NGO sector. So again, they need to have some lot more thought around policies and strategies. The challenges we also have is that if you think about the sector, it's actually not a rich sector. And, and you know, even though there's a volume of money that goes through it, and it goes to this, this concept of perception that it's a really rich sector, but there's also a lot of people and a lot of staff and a lot of uh, stakeholders that engage in the ecosystem that use what we call shadow IT. So if you can get a free application to do it, they'll choose a free application. They don't use paid, app, they, they'll use the, the, be, the best and the cheapest that they can just to save costs, naturally, because that's what occurs in the sector. Um, so, you know, each of those has its challenges. Um, often you don't have corporate devices. So I've just come from an event where they're looking at enterprise technology. The NGO sector doesn't think how they can actually prevent it happening by going enterprise technologies. Can I save a lot of money rather than trying to manage, you know, digital old digital technologies like you know having our own uh, phones and our own laptops and devices. So you know we often take our personal devices into these spaces, which means that you're having personal conversations and business conversations in the same on the same device. So there's a it's a, it's a complex. Uh, problem and, and we obviously can't solve it in, in this 90 minutes but it's to raise your awareness to, to go back to your organisations that you need more work you need to have further follow up sessions to, to whiteboard some of the challenges that you're having in this space what would happen I'm going to uh, jump in, in there sector. Lisa in the interest of time mm -hmm. we got to get moving along I'm going to throw any last words yeah. on this case study dandy no Well, I mean, there's, there's uh, some some great questions which have come out in the chat, uh, and, and what Lisa has mentioned as well. It it, it very much reminds me of a snowball. Um, you know, you get the the similar case study, and then it builds and builds because you 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 then go into a scenario play. 
And uh, and I think the underlying factor is yes, you know, policies and strategies need to be firmly in place. We ca ca kidnap and ransom globally. Um, main uh, main donors uh, and governments have strict guidelines and policies around this, and organisations are, are you know uh, are accountable to kidnap and ransom and, and the process around that. Uh, and it's 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 very widely published, and and uh, uh, yeah, and there are there are ways of managing it. Um, with uh, with ransomware online, it is a very different world at the moment. And uh, NGOs, no, um, yeah, we talk about NGOs, but I think the world as a whole need to need to really sort of not rely on all the internal training that they have for uh, for IT and IT use, but have a, a systematic approach to to when these things happen. Um, but also now we're moving into uh, I work for Christian Aid, and we've always worked through partners. And our partners don't always have, um, well, they don't have the mechanisms and systems in place for, a, you know, for a ransomware type of attack or any cyber form of attack. So we, as a major donor to a to a, a partner, we have a, re, a, a responsibility to support those partners as well. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a much broader and wider um, uh, discussion, and also yeah, for, for policy so. Okay, Degovic put a good comment in the uh, the chat, but we'll come back to that when we do it. Recommendations moving along. I, I want to get into Lisa's case study. So, Lisa, over to you. Yeah, this this one's an interesting one. So, this is one of the most recent ones, uh, and this is 2021. So, this is only uh, in March. So it's only just over a month ago, and this did in, involve um, Facebook. And again, this is not a, a this is a positive that's come out of Facebook as well. So, Facebook US and Canada. Um, and the organisations that were impacted were um, Uyghur aid agencies, journalists and activists uh, around the world in US, Australia, Canada, Syria, Turkey, Turkey Kazakhstan. What actually happened was Facebook, through their threat reporting mechanisms and their algorithms, can actually detect when there's unusual activity um, and false profiles and, and access um, from various uh, locations into their system. And they revealed in March that it had blocked Chinese hackers um, from using their social media platform to track uh, Uyghur aid agencies and journalists and activists living abroad. So what they were actually looking for were people external to China that were communicating with the Uyghur people and those who were activists and, and support agencies uh, for the Uyghur people that were living overseas. So in other words, it could have been any of your aid agencies and any of your NGOs anywhere in the world. In this case, it was in these particular countries. They tracked it. They know they knew where it, the um, the the attack, the malicious attack, was coming from, and so they shut it down. And then they they reported back um, to organisations. But how they did it was interesting, um, and this is why I brought this one in: is that it's um, because the systems in in Facebook don't actually allow, or very rarely, it's very difficult to get it in malware to get into staff computers and personal devices. So most people, as we know, I said 56% of the world is connected on social media and Facebook is one of the, the, the predominant ones that we use. So this cyber espionage campaign predominantly manifested itself in sending people from Facebook to an external site. So in other words, they they knew that they were, they were, they, um, were um, penetrated into the Facebook site but they couldn't get the malware in. They then redirected you outside Facebook for a watering hole attack so that you would go to your own device and an independent website. And on that independent website, which is actually a false profile or a false website or a false application, you would then download the malware onto your device or onto your personal device. And they therefore then had access to your system. So some of the things that they did, which was really interesting and, and to, be, to be mindful of, and this is how far that they can go, um, bearing in mind um, the way that uh, China and Russia can in, can in fact um, be quite insidious in their, their behaviours. So they imp impersonated websites, news websites, uh, Uyghurs, they uh, created false profiles, they infected popular websites and then led people to those popular websites um, from Facebook. Um, they also created fake accounts. They posed as actually um, activists and, and Uyghurs and encourage people that they were friendly and, and you know, engage with them over a period of time and then led them to uh, external malicious links and applications. And all this was about was to try and get the malware so that they could actually start to track 
um, what people were up to and find the location of those people that were supporting the Uyghurs and also those people within China who were actually, um, you know, collaborating with them. Um, fake app stores, they go to a fair length of degree to do this, um, to create fake app stores themselves, um, you know, and trojanise those. Um, so that means, you know, they, they come into what we normally call the safe application and come in and spread. So there's a variety of mechanisms. So again, it tells you that if you're using any of these social media applications and suddenly you're taken to an external site and it takes you outside the safe realms of being on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. So if you link on anything within any of those applications, it stays on that platform. If it goes to an external platform, it's obviously a malicious. They're trying deliberately to lead you there. The good thing about this is, and this is some of the positive stuff though, is that those hackers were actually blocked by Facebook. So they actually did recognize it. They did know that it was there. They could identify where they were coming from and, and predominantly um, you know, uh, organizations around the world do know these hack, hacking groups. So Facebook did share their findings um, and threats with peers so they could actually uh, enable um, some processes and how they could actually ensure that if anybody had been impacted that they were notified. And the other thing that's important is that that um, these big uh, malicious cyber espionage episodes also do bring in a geopolitical response. So bear in mind that a lot of these activities do fit into, for example, China's um, you know Beijing operational approach, um, which is to track dissident groups. But importantly, the question that I've asked here is, what are the boundaries? Like, how far do our boundaries as NGOs go? What are the risks that these have just imposed? Because what they're looking for is who external to China is helping people within China. How will we influence what's happening in China externally? And of course, that can in, in fact um, impose high levels of risk to our own families and our own communities. You know, there can be journalists that are, and we know there are journalists who are kidnapped, there are journalists that are that are have false charges laid against them. Um, there are journalists who have been involved in, and activists who have been actively involved in working in some of these geopolitical uh, environments that are unaware that they've been tracked. They land in the country and the next thing they're in jail because they've been charged with an offence. And that means that as, a, as NGOs and organisations that are playing in this space, we have to be particularly careful. So these are really important um, malicious cyber episodes that occur. And of course, it's always, you know, always sort of the, the, the answer there, you know, prevention is, is better than cure. But, you know, it's to demonstrate to you here that without a doubt, the fingers in the pie and the, the web that they weave can extend outside the countries that you're working in and can extend back to the families and our own communities. And for example, when you're sharing images and things on social media and you may be, you may have staff that are working in some of these geopolitical areas, the cyber espionage and the hackers can actually get in and see your images. You might be putting posting up images saying, oh, hi, look at this great scene of where I am. And they can actually identify, they can actually do this, um, software that can identify the locations of those images, the photos. They can identify, for example, you know, my backgrounds, you know, Castle Castle, and you know, those sorts of things. So, it is really important. But I did want to also to identify that the, the people that we often are the critic, the, the most critical of, also do um, a lot of work in this space in terms of, of blocking some of these um, these episodes that are there. So, but I think this this case really does identify how strong education needs to be in the uses of our social media to make sure that we have um, security measures and, 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 and how these things can manifest themselves and what it looks like when you're being led away from another site and that would lead you into identifying that it's predominantly likely to be a malicious attack and trying to get into um, to load um, Trojanware or malware onto your phones and devices and then obviously get back in and track. So I'm not sure if there's any questions come up. I know we, we are mindful of time. We're going to move on to what's next as well in that. Is there any questions at all in the... Uh, Andy, uh, did you raise your hand, Andy? Yeah, I, I, I yeah. just think, I think there's a trend here that I'm, that I'm hearing and seeing is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Lisa, because I think if, mm. and what I see is if we become reliant on specific text apps uh, and social media sites, you know, that following the norm, 
there is, a, mm. from, from what I see, there's a perceived risk there, an increased perceived risk. Mm. And we are, mm. uh, you know, as humans, we follow the, the path of least resistance. We want to follow the easy route. And uh, mm. for example, a few, a few months ago, the WhatsApp um, media out, out blast that what which happened. Um, mm. Everyone was had a knee jerk reaction to then go and find another provider or you know, signal or, or, or others and others didn't want to move across because WhatsApp was their life. You know, that's what they, they felt comfortable with. I'm just interested to hear your thoughts. As humans, as, as we're moving more into this digital space, do we need to be more agile rather than reliant on specific areas and, and be able to switch very quickly when, uh, when, when things like this happen? I'm not, I think, I'm gonna say agile, but I think selective as well. Um, so um, if you're going to have a high level business conversation, don't have it on WhatsApp. Um, if you're going to be sending attachments and documents, don't use email. If you're going to be um, you know, sharing um, commercial information or in a high risk environment, then you need to be very cautious about how you use social media channels. So um, it's not about don't use them, it's about being wise to use them. So, you know, I use a paid application called Streamer, for example, which is one of the most secure digital um, applications that we can use. I try to avoid WhatsApp because I actually know um, how much the data is being tracked. I also know that even though it is encrypted end to end, there are some security features on some of our phones that allow us to back up those conversations. And the minute our conversations are backed up to cloud, for example, on an iPhone, you automatically lose your encryption um, protection and that, that data is able to be hacked then. So you've just placed what is an encrypted conversation into a non-encrypted environment purely because you don't know the setting on your phone uh, is there. So agile, yes, more educated about settings, more so and selective on how you use those applications because they're all good and they're all bad there was a big shift obviously from whatsapp over to signal but bear in mind in the state um, there is reg regulations that also requires encrypted conversations to have a back end so there is a back end so that in the state um, the military and and the government actually do have an access to data so i think you are right um, the hackers and espionage um, and the cyber you know, nation state actors do um, know our patterns of behaviour and they target those, so you're absolutely correct, but we just need to be smart in terms of our making sure we use security settings and, and ensuring that we understand that. So for those that don't know, there's new settings on your new iPhone that ask you, do you want to be tracked? Do you want your data and so forth to be tracked? Don't just go no, 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 no to everything or don't go yes, 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 yes. Think about it. Um, before you do so you know think before you connect think before you, you say yes look at it and understand it I think that's important and there is one important um, there is a big um, push in terms of social media think before you connect so if somebody is trying to connect you and you all of a sudden on LinkedIn start getting thousands of people from China and you don't really know China very well or you get a whole lot of people are Russian I got somebody the other day that was that was Russian was educated um, in, uh, I can't remember where, and was living in Beijing, and he had about 10 connections on LinkedIn, I think there was a problem. So again, it's, it's, it's being aware of who you're going to connect with. Mindful of the time, uh, I know we've only got a, a couple more minutes, and we do just need to get through um, this last little piece. So over to you, um, James, if you want to pick up on this one. You're still on mute, James. I'm going to give all three of us sort of a minute to uh, just kind of sum up. Uh, if you do have any last minute questions, please fire them in. Uh, we're not going to have a chance to go to Dagobert's questions. We just don't have time. But just a couple of the main issues here are is where in the humanitarian sector does this sit? So most of the time we say, you know, if there's a digital question, oh, talk to the IT department. Now, IT departments and NGOs, basically, if your computer is having a problem connecting to Outlook or you've forgotten your password, they can sort you out. Is an IT staff member and the average NGO the one to answer questions around digital security risk management? My response would be no. Are your typical security managers the right person to answer questions around digital security risk management? It's challenging for a lot of us, especially those that are a little bit older. And remember too that a lot of the senior management teams and NGOs are probably coming from my generation, which still remembers when you know phones were connected to the wall by a cord. Um, so are they the right ones? 
So one of the first and major issues we need to resolve in the humanitarian sector is how do we address this issue? Where does it sit? And how do we inform and make good decisions about our digital future, digital security, reputation risk, transparency, perception, and vulnerability? I pass it over to Andy, and then Lisa can finish up for us. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, I mean, coming from a security background, I, I'm a great believer that um, we have uh, we our roles, not just within the NGL sector, but our roles as a whole um, are very broad and diverse. Uh, we're not; it's not just about putting walls up and razor wire up and, and doing security training. It's so more more to it than that, and holistic. And um, the the shift between security and security risk management is the way um, uh, our roles are going. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we've been uh, delivering training on security, uh, digital security for, for a very long time now. And now organizations are picking it up as a, as a standalone element. And it, it, we, it can't be in isolation. It has to be uh, integrated into, into so much more. Uh, and I, I, I believe it, it sits in both areas but as a security risk manager, we have we have the uh, the 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 ability to push it harder uh, and be less diplomatic and and uh, and actually hold um, people to uh, organisations to account um, when when we see uh, breaches and so forth. And yeah, I, I believe that's where it sit, it sits with us and others, uh, and not not just in a, a standalone area in ICT, um, some behind some uh, some desk somewhere. We all have a responsibility to ensure that information training and and, and uh, processes and, and policies are, are aligned with everything we do. So yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. Last word to Lisa. Yeah, and, and what I would say is I'm gonna finish on a positive note. What I'm gonna finish off is I want you all to remember um, we, 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 you know, we've talked about the risks and, and they certainly do exist and it's the awareness, but the positive of this is that you can shift the conversation from being fear, uncertainty and dread to an opportunity as well. So whenever you talk about risk, there's an opportunity risk and a threat risk. We are obviously have a very large uh, exposure risk to, uh, to threat, but we also have an opportunity to get the questions right. So in other words, what I would leave you with is the opportunity for your businesses to thrive and to grow and to ensure that the people that you serve by using digital technologies is so high. The positive is here is to constantly continue to be engaged and, and as, as much as the, the clearing of the digital fog is, you know, the fog is ubiquitous, so is education. Education is also ubiquitous. It should be everywhere and in, in everything that we do. So awareness, and a positivity about it is, is critical. So, you know, your way forward, every organisation I would be encouraging to have, um, you know, further education, for example, in social engineering and misinformation, what, what malware, how people get in, those things. The more you educate yourself, the less risk that there is. Um, the more you're aware of it, the less risk there is. So again, I want to make sure that we don't just think that it's all negative. It is a very large risk, yes, I'm not denying that, but I think there is a positive here that because we're aware of it, we also have the opportunity to be educated about it. And uh, and I think that's an important important place to, to um, finish up on. You just muted, Lisa. Um, just the very last slide is that um, I'm just to let everybody know there is a few questions we haven't been able to answer in time, but we are going to follow that up and I think there'll be um, some uh, information that will be posted on the GISF uh, website uh, as well. And I'm certain if there's any questions that can be emailed through and we can certainly get you some answers. So we don't want to think that we've left you um, hanging um, by a thread. It is a very big subject. We do want to raise this and, and I'll, I will finish on this point. Bearing in mind, this is the very first year the digital security has been added to the HBNW event. And so that will tell you we're 21 years too late. So, um, you know, we need to catch up now. And so we, we know, and I think this is a huge opportunity. So the, the key is it's the, it's the uh, you know, the, the pebble in the, in the pond, the ripple effect, go back to your organizations and don't just stop, don't just stop at this event. This is only an introduction. And thank right. you everyone for coming. Yep, thanks a lot.
Um, I do. I did notice very earlier on in the chat there was someone who was asking if they could contact you around some of your sources for this information, so that they can take absolutely. it forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm easily stalkable on any of the social media channels. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.